Hello and welcome to our discussion, An Environment Ripe for Change, Financing the Net Zero Transition. My name is Andy Staples and I'm the Regional Head for Policy and Insights at Economist Impact. Many thanks to ADB for giving this opportunity to have this important discussion as part of the ADB's 55th annual meeting. Just a few housekeeping items before we get underway. It's best to use this um, uh, to view this webinar using uh, Google Chrome. You'll also find a box with a selection of further reading on this topic available for download. Um, without further ado then, I'm delighted to be joined by my four esteemed panelists. And let me just briefly introduce them to you. Warren Evans is Climate Envoy to the Office of the President, ADB. Mr. Evans is a Climate Envoy uh, and provides broad oversight and guidance for ADB's climate operations including optimizing uh, climate finance scale and impact, mobilizing new and additional technical and financial resources, strengthening ADB's external climate partnerships and engagement with uh, international climate agreements and initiatives, and reinforcing capacity development for climate change operations. Warren, welcome. Stella uh, Chow is Head of Sustainable Finance uh, at International ANZ. She has over 18 years banking experience and has held a number of uh, structured finance industry coverage roles in Asia, the United Kingdom and Australia. In addition to her sustainable finance responsibilities, Ms Chow is involved in setting and uh, implementing the bank's strategy in relation to uh, environmental sustainability. Uh, Stella, welcome. Um, we also have uh, Zoe Witten, who is Head of Impact at the Pollination Group. Ms. Witten uh, uh, assists companies and investors to navigate the impacts of climate change and to build new businesses and products that are transition aligned. She previously led the award-winning APAC uh, ESG research team at City, advising institutional investors globally on climate change and sustainable uh, development. Zoe, thank you for joining us. Uh, and finally, uh, last but not uh, least by any means, Helen McLeod, Deputy Director General, the Head of the Green Growth Planning and Implementation Division at Global Green Growth Institute. In this role, she leads the 30 plus country offices spread throughout Latin America, Africa, Asia and the Middle East and the Pacific. Uh, and the implementation work to achieve economic growth that is environmentally sustainable, socially inclusive and climate compatible. Uh, so with that, uh, welcome everybody and uh, let's get underway. Um, I should also just note that you'll find, uh, for the audience, you'll find four biographies of all of our panellists on the screen under this media player. Um, just to set the scene for this discussion, financial institutions have a paramount role to play in scaling up investments in climbing, uh, climate solutions. They can help provide the financing necessary for the net zero transition through decarbonisation and building climate resilient economies. But is the financial system in its current form able to support a transition to net zero and build resilient economies and societies? With that brief opener, Helena, I'm going to come to you first of all to, to help us set the scene. There's been a lot going on in recent years, uh, not least the rise of um, uh, uh, concern uh, over uh, uh, the climate crisis that's been coming to the top of the agenda for organisations, for companies uh, and for society uh, in general. We've, we've had COVID and during that period we've also had some renewed or uh, um, uh, uh, new commitments to achieving net zero by countries and companies uh, as well. But where are we today? What's the state of play? Thank you, Andy. First, lovely to be here. So exciting and such a, an important panel at this time. So where are we? Well, if you say in a nutshell, I would say the world is in a little bit of uh, trouble at the minute. Um, you know, as you said, yes, we've had COVID and, and so many eyes have been focused on COVID. But what we've also seen this year is wildfires across Europe across America, across Australia, the highest temperature in the UK, it hit 40. Recently, we've had Pakistan devastated and half of its harvest lost. These are absolutely major. So our 100 year weather conditions are happening on a monthly basis, sometimes multiple events during each month. So that is incredibly serious. It's almost like we're now at a pivotal point where, yes, the world is waking up. But the question is, are we doing enough quickly enough? Um, we are currently not on track to stay within the 1.5 degrees warming from pre-industrial levels, which will keep us in a, a relatively safe space, recognising that we're still way off 1.5 degrees now and we're seeing all of this extreme weather events on a regular basis. Um, so in short, we have a lot to do, but the great thing is we have many of the solutions already. 
And as you say, the financial sector is going to play an absolutely key role, and it's how we can mobilise and accelerate what we can do for everybody to step up and every organisation to, to step up to this challenge. Thank you very much. And, and Warren, if I could come to you, uh, Helen there was mapping out sort of state of play and she mentioned that we have a lot to do, but I think there's also a lot going on. Um, have we reached some kind of tipping point where awareness and activity is coming together to um, uh, to realise real change? Well, I'm, I'm not sure we're at a tipping point yet. I think that uh, we've seen uh, progress uh, be reversed too many times to to think that we're over the over the hump here. But there is a lot going on and, and a lot of progress being made. Uh, the, the, the challenge is really how do you go to scale and fast with uh, programs like decarbonization, uh, renewable energy, et cetera, uh, for the mitigation side and, and very massive investments in climate resilience to deal with the kinds of impacts that uh, were just mentioned. Uh, there is progress being made. There are some, some very large scale initiatives. Uh, ADB has one that I'll mention now, the energy tra transition mechanism, uh, which is looking at, at uh, uh, shutting down coal-fired power plants 10 to 15 years early in Indonesia, Philippines, and, and some other countries. Uh, these require massive amounts of both public and private sector finance, uh, but they are doable. And uh, we've been working on some feasibility studies and are rolling out programs now that could result in the world's largest decarbonization program that we thus far. Um, and, and so those kind of initiatives are required. Uh, and we've, we've, we are seeing progress, but uh, finance is a problem. And I know we're going to talk about that. Uh, so I'll, I'll, leave it, I'll leave a little bit of space for more on finance later on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Warren. And, and, and let's let, let's come across to, to, to Stella um, uh, with uh, ANZ, and I'd very much like to get your perspective from your vantage point um, uh, as a head of sustainable um, uh, finance at uh, International for, for ANZ uh, as well. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm slipping between ANZ and ANZ. That's my uh, my English background there. But um, uh, Stella, from, from your perspective then, uh, thinking about um, where we are with the financial uh, sector in general, is it fit for purpose to facilitate the net zero transition? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I think, you know, what you've seen over the past few years is um, commercial banks increasingly focused on um, climate risks, um, climate disclosures and, and ESG disclosures. And I think historically this was really driven by the institutional investor base. Um, but what I've seen more recently is a lot more action from governments and regulators asking for not only ESG disclosures, but also around bank stress tests. So, you know, do we know what the climate risks are to our portfolio? Um, how are you, um, you know, uh, testing various climate scenarios and how is it going to impact you? And so that's a bit of a shift. I think in terms of um, the financial, uh, broader financial system, I think there there are the risks, but there are the, also the opportunities that um, this whole decarbonization piece uh, presents itself. And you know, ADB alluded to that a little bit earlier. I think the promising thing has been the level of coordination that we're seeing across financial institutions. So one example is the establishment of the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, which ANZ is one of many members with a serious amount of private capital committed. Um, is it going to be enough for the 125 billion, uh, uh, sorry, trillion that's required to decarbonize the economy? Probably not. But I think there is that general understanding that this has to be sort of a, uh, call it a PPP, if you will, of public sector um, funding as well as the private sector coming together. Um, the public sector at the moment with, you know, energy security, uh, food security issues, uh, which require policy responses, that means that there are lots of competing um, uh, issues, um, requirements for, for them to cover. So I think, um, you know, banks in particular have an important role to play. Um, they do a very good job of managing their own emissions, whether that's green buildings and other initiatives that they have in place. But to be very frank, that's only a very small component of their total impact. So where they lend is really critical. 
um, providing support for new technologies and new industries that are going to assist decarbonization is important. And also, um, you know, many banks, including ANZ, have what we call sustainability targets. So, you know, commitments to fund 50 billion by 2025 in terms of funding, but also facilitating capital towards the SDGs and in particular into, um, you know, decarbonizing the economy. Mm. Thank, thank you very much, Stella. And I think uh, very opportune now to come to, to, to you, Zoe, to be thinking about those, those opportunities uh, and, and um, but perhaps you could give us a, a bit of insight from, from, from your particular vantage point about how you um, help organisations, companies to find those opportunities and build uh, business models that are focused around transition. It's a really good and a very interesting question, because as I'm sure you can anticipate, a lot of the time when we're working, um, I've been working with investors for over a decade and we work with a lot of large corporates as, as well. When people come to talk about decarbonisation, talk about climate change, they often come in with a headspace that's about, you know, someone's asked me to do a report and I've got to make some commitments and it's all about risk and obligation and cost. Um, and very, it is, it is increasingly regular, but until recently has not been particularly regular for organisations to look at climate change and think about opportunity. Mm. Um, and that's, you know, it's quite interesting. It's something we talk a lot about. Uh, a friend of mine used to get asked a lot on panels and the like, what's the number one climate change risk? And she used to say there's no number one climate change risk because climate change, both the decarbonisation of the economy, but also the physical impacts of climate change, change all sorts of industries. So you're basically talking about accelerated structural change across a number of different, or well, most of your sectors, actually, anything that's got a resource, significant resource or energy requirement footprint in its own value chain. Um, and that creates a huge number of opportunities. And I think one of the biggest changes that we've seen probably in the last two years, and I noticed this coming across from public markets to private markets as a, as a, as a really big, eye-opener with the type of activity that was happening has just been this rush to opportunity. So, uh, you know, every every month or so we get contacted by a financial services firm of some sort who says, well, we've realised there's a lot of opportunity really opening up here. We haven't been thinking about climate change as generating opportunities and as generating structural change before. How do we, how do we even start to get into that? And, you know, to your question about how do you start to walk down that path? How do you help an organization walk down that path? It really is about starting to build, and this is a bit of a clunky term, but I, we haven't found a better one for it yet. Starting to build a bit of strategic intuition about what transition actually means. You know, you have to take, we've all seen those charts in the various different scenarios that have got current emissions from different things on one side and net zero on the other side, and you've got different rates of compression for different sectors. The flip side of those charts is the growth profile for all of the solutions that provide that decarbonisation pathway. And that's not just true for decarbonisation, it's also true for resilience and adaptation. As much as that's a very difficult topic to think about, there is a whole series of growth opportunities that come with providing people with the services and the goods and the models and the frameworks that allow and will allow us to make our economies more resilient as we have to go through whatever portion of that physical climate risk we're going to experience. Um, and so we, we, we often start with saying, look, let's just step back and talk about how is the economy going to change around you? And often as soon as we do that, people start to look into that and go, oh, wow, I'm, I'm used to thinking like a business and I can understand now how I can relate to those opportunities and, and, and the fact that I'd like to get exposure to them. And that's true for corporates as much as it is true for investors. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to come back to this issue of, uh, of um, you know, focusing on on the opportunity and, and actually the financing of that, because there seems to be a big gap between the opportunity and financing the, uh, the opportunities or realising the opportunity. But, but just before we get there, I'd like to, um, Warren, if I could come back to you on, on the, some, some of the terminology that we're using, net zero commitments, uh, just transition, adaptation, uh, and particularly from the perspective uh, of, of ADB uh, here, here in, in Asia, could you give us a sense of how net zero commitments and adaptation, what's the balance there? And, uh, and what do you hear from the, from the people that, that you're working with? Well, for, for ADB, uh, we've just increased our commitment or our, our ambition for climate financing from $80 billion to $100 billion uh, between 2019 and 2030. Uh, 
uh, to give you an idea of the breakdown, about 65% of that will be for uh, mitigation or uh, approaching net zero, uh, about 35% for adaptation or climate resilience. We would like to do more on the, on the climate resilience side. Uh, it is more complex. Uh, it's actually quite a bit easier to finance projects that are focused on decarbonization or introducing renewable energy or energy efficiency. Uh, understanding how to invest in climate resilience is much more complicated, requires much more analytical work, um, and quite a bit more policy reform in a, in a number of the countries where we work. Uh, but if I can if I can come back to the 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 in many ways they're one and the same. Um, the the climate resilience part or the adapt adaptation part is we're feeling much more pressed. It's more urgent now than ever before, as was mentioned earlier uh, in, in recognition of that the impacts are already hitting us, and also in recognition that, that um, it's pretty unlikely, given today's scenarios, emission scenarios, that we're going to hit 1.5, that we're going to stay below 1.5 degrees centigrade. Uh, and, and so the, the risks are increasing. Uh, the impacts on vulnerable communities are much more obvious now. Uh, what we're finding is that when we engage with, with countries, when we talk about policy and regulatory reform, uh, it's not a mitigation or adaptation agenda. It really is a broader climate change agenda. And, and so the kinds of reforms that are required, for example, to open up space for the private sector to invest more in mitigation also generally opens up opportunities for the private sector to invest more in adaptation as well. So it's, it's not an either or. And the, the critical thing from the point of view of finance is that we all know that there's not near enough public sector money out there uh, and there won't be enough to, to deal with these issues. So the question is, can we more effectively use public sector finance to mobilize private sector? And so the, you know, earlier there was discussion of PPPs and, and so on. We're really focused on how can we use the public sector money that, that ADB and other multilateral development banks have access to, to try and really open up space for the private sector. And a lot of that, a lot of that requires uh, us to work with governments to set the stage for the policy framework and regulatory framework so that they can actually, so the private sector can play a much bigger role. Uh, but there is, um, I think that the challenge, just to, to recap, the, the real challenge in my view is, is not the, the net zero. Technically, we can do that. Financially, we can do that. Uh, politically, uh, that's a different, different uh, part of the story. But on the adaptation side and dealing particularly in, in improving resilience of vulnerable communities, I think we've got a long ways to go to figure out how to make uh, actions take place at the scale required to actually help these vulnerable communities. Thank you. Well, well th th thank you, Warren. And perhaps if I could uh, follow on that theme and, and, and Stella come to you directly, we've been talking about ADB, its relationship with, with government and policy. Warren, they're talking about um, the need to, to, to open up the space for private sector investment in things like adaptation. But, but how do you see that from, uh, from, from your vantage point and, and perhaps more broadly from the private sector? What are some of the challenges that you're facing? Or, or indeed, um, where is the focus? Is it on achieving net zero? Is, it, is that adaptation? How might that be changing? Sorry, there was quite a lot there for you to uh, unpack. Yeah, maybe just to sort of follow on from ADB, I spent the first 10 years in Asia focusing on financing infrastructure projects in Southeast Asia predominantly. And I think, you know, the climate piece or the ESG piece is already in a lot of the um, multilateral banks, export finance agencies and structured finance banks DNA because they're familiar with the equator principles. They're used to financing large scale projects. So I think the role for um, entities like the ADB and the export credit agencies uh, to mobilize commercial bank debt and get projects off the ground is really significant. Um, given that, you know, they can support very large investments and that's what's typically needed to, to come up with the, the total financing package for a large scale project. But also they have the, the capability in-house to, to, to meet that market gap piece, which may be due to project costs or more likely going forward is going to be a result of, you know, new technologies. We, we talk a lot about green hydrogen and becoming 
you know, more commercial, um, the build out of um, electric vehicle, um, you know, supply chains and infrastructure. I think there's a really important role for them to play. Um, you know, to date, they've been instrumental in, uh, you know, the energy transition in Asia, the, the renewable energy projects that we've seen in the Philippines and have often benefited from export finance and, and multilateral development bank um, support. Um, so outside of renewable energy, I think one, a couple of other sectors that, that, that are important are mass transportation and also a role for them to play. So I think from a um, private bank perspective, you know, we're here to support our customers' energy transition. We're already starting to see very large energy um, companies shift from oil and gas to uh, renewable energy, to um, building out electric vehicle manufacturing plants, acquiring um, you know, solar platforms, et cetera. So part of our role is to you know, assist in the financing um, of that. But I think it's fair to say that, you know, uh, an upstream oil project where you have a very clear global market price for what, what the output is, is um, terrible for the environment, but a lot simpler for, for banks to analyze than potentially a natural capital project in Vietnam, where the value is in um, potentially uh, voluntary carbon credits, where there is no easy way to set the price or um, you know a renewable energy project in a market where there isn't the enabling regulation or a attractive tariff or credit worthy off taker so it, it's pretty um, complex um, but what I would say is that you know increasingly as banks reduce their exposure to the um, more traditional energy sectors, which are high polluting and looking for lower carbon solutions, there is, um, you know, a huge amount of, 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 of will and, and financing capacity to support, um, you know, our customers and, and, and companies that are making that shift. So I think what you'll see is um, a little bit more focus. I think increasingly banks, um, you know, some banks, and, and this is quite rare, actually have various capital weightings for um, green projects versus brown. So you're starting to see maybe a capital benefit or a pricing benefit. Um, and where I sit in the sustainable finance world, we're also looking at um, pricing mechanisms within what we call sustainability linked loans or bonds which has um, a, a positive, or I would say, a, a, you know, a, a discount to the financing cost if you outperform your sustainability metrics or alternatively a, a penalty if you're not meeting those requirements. So I think financing um, is quite innovative and are uh, looking at, you know, differential sort of in, in pricing to, to move outcomes to become, you know, um, for companies to become more sustainable, to embed ESG into their financing um, explicitly through their loan agreements or through their bond issuances. Um, and so there are sorts of different levels of that, that, that uh, roles that, that commercial banks can play in, in sort of speeding up the transition. It's not simple um, and it's not going as fast as we would like, but it's certainly um, something that we're working on. But thank you very much. And, and perhaps if I could just follow on a little bit from that, Helena, uh, and come to you. Um, uh, uh, Stella there was, was talking about some of the challenges. Warren also mentioned them as well around uh, analysis, uh, pricing, regulatory regime and so on as, as challenges to, to overcome. And, and, and at um, GGGI, um, you're all about promoting that um, sustainable growth uh, um, um, uh, pattern and creating the sort of you know, bankable projects that um, that finance could be investing in. Are these common issues? Can you give us a sense of of how you're helping to overcome those issues or, or the conversations that you have or the strategies you have to overcome these challenges? Yeah, thanks, Andy. Um, so GGGI works at that policy level, so sets that climate and low carbon policy with our members and then helps the implementation. So as Stella was referring to, many of our countries, and not just our less well-off countries, don't have the regulatory environments 
in place to enable, uh, for instance, a, an accelerated scale-up of renewable energy. So an example, we recently we supported Guyana with having an energy policy and regulatory framework that would allow independent power producers of renewable energy to sell onto the grid. And without that, you just can't have the scale up. That's quite a common problem. Mm. So we do that type of thing. Um, and that, that is on the renewable energy side, but also on the adaptation side. So most countries still don't have adaptation plans. I'm currently sitting with one of our members in Dubai, uh, a, you know, UAE, a very, very advanced economy, and we're working with them on their, their national adaptation plan. Um, so there's absolutely a desire and a commitment from all of the, the countries across all the regions of the world that we work in um, to really improve their, their policies, their strategies, their regulatory environment, but there's still gaps in knowledge. And, and to be honest, on the adaptation side, as Warren said, we're still learning as a globe, um, but we need to learn very quickly. Mm. So that's on the actual policy side. Then when you get to the, the, the finance side, the implementation side, again, Stella referred to the bond market. And I think that's one of the biggest opportunities. So we've, last year, for instance, we, we helped Peru with the issuance of what has been the largest green bond of any sovereign in history. So that was about 3.25 billion US. And we also helped with a sustainability bond denominated in euros for the first time in the Latin America and Caribbean region. Now that has caused so much interest from other countries. We've had requests from over 10 countries who haven't done green bonds before for us to work with them on green bond issuances. And of course, it's really essential that you get the framework right. So it's not just greenwashing. And so the money from the green bond really goes into the right sectors. And that's quite fascinating because it's not just on the renewable energy side, but we're working with Ecuador on their Galapagos Marine Reserve, so the blue bonds. We can work on, on include peatland restoration, rainforest protection, as well as all your more traditional um, e-mobility and renewable energy. So we've worked out that if had a, just a 3% shift in the global bond market towards green bonds from the current 1%, would have a massive contribution to accelerating the green growth transition. So mm. it's a really exciting opportunity in the market. And can I just um, uh, stay with you, Hela, uh, Helena, for, for, for one second to, to think about, you, you gave some examples there from, from other parts of the world. Looking at Asia and particularly sort of um, uh, uh, developing Asia, um, are you encouraged by what you see? Do you see that there is sufficient demand or people, are, you know, governments asking for this uh, um, uh, sort of policy help? Well, obviously, Asia is a, a, a very, very wide group of different countries. So we see a commitment with all of the countries, but recognizing that many of the countries really feel, it, feel and rightly so, that a just energy transition is really important. So they don't just want to go it alone. They need the investment and the support. Um, other countries like Lao PDR, you know, they're LDCs. They're, they're at a very um, nascent stage in many of their markets related to, to climate and, and green growth. So very, very different stages of, of um, advancement in terms of understanding knowledge, regulatory frameworks and ability. Um, so what I would say is, yes, there is an absolute growing interest. Um, what I've seen in, in Asia is, um, again, as in all over the world, a lack of bankable projects, green investment projects. So, you know, there is finance, the finance wants a home, but there isn't enough bankable projects. So that's one area that we're really trying to support on. We supported recently um, the, the, the largest global uh, issuance of um, uh, floating solar PV in India, 600 megawatts. So that's really exciting because it means that it's not so controversial in terms of land, which is very constrained in India. But the question is still, how do you get from 600 megawatts to 20 gigawatts, for instance? So that's the question that, that, that Warren posed. I think that having enough project preparation money and trying to find a way for the commercial sector to, to come into play with more money for that project preparation is a real way that we can scale um, our renewable energy investment, e-mobility, and even some of the, the resilient sectors that we need to, to work in as well. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Zoe, I, I wonder if I could just uh, come come back to you on on this issue of, of scalability. Um, it seems that there are, are, are plenty of opportunities. There's plenty of innovative technologies. There's plenty of, of demand as well. But we we seem to hit a bit of a, a roadblock when it comes to to scalability. Helena, there was just mapping out some of the 
um, steps that we need to take or, uh, you know, globally in order to uh, overcome that. But from your perspective as well, and particularly working with uh, investors and companies, what, what, how do you see this, how, how do you overcome this challenge of, of scalability? That's a good question, and I and it picks up. I wanted to pick up on a couple of points that the all the rest of the panelists made through that um, conversation, um, and one of them is about this concept of we can call it scalability, we can call it unlocking finance. You, you hear you you hear a number of different words where people sort of say, "Look, we've got a bit of movement. We've got technologies. We've got ideas about what to do. We've got appetite from a sort of general group of stakeholders." but we're really, really struggling to convert that into the type of activity that we know we need to see to meet the types of um, numerical targets that Stella was talking about earlier and the net zero, but also adaptation tasks that we have ahead of us. One of the, you know, there's, a, there's been an interesting dynamic in quite a few regions wherein um, obviously, uh, to Helena's point, policy progress is very various. Even within regions we often describe as, as um, monolithic, um, so this isn't true everywhere, but we have seen something happening in a number of regions where we've seen um, over and over again, a lot of preparation and um, or preparedness, I should say, in the commercial private sector and also in the financial sector to support and become aligned with whether it's net zero or increasingly resilience, um, but not as much action on the policy front. And I mean, I'm speaking to you from Sydney and that's been a really distinct feature of our market here is, you know, by the time our policy changed about four months ago now, we, uh, a lot of our private institutions were already leagues ahead of our policy just because the political situation had been so different, difficult. And Australia is probably a bit sort of uniquely challenged in that respect potentially, but it's not completely unusual for us to be in that type of situation. And I think that's part of the reason that we come to this conversation often and we say, look, we've got this huge preparedness or at least, um, you know, vocalised commitment from the finance sector to get behind this. We, we've got some ideas, but we never seem to be able, to, and, and projects, but we never seem to be able to connect that apparent willingness to, to activity. And the reason I think, you know, to your question of how do you get through that, one of the things we see and observe in a lot of the jurisdictions we work in is that when we talk about private sector capital, and I'm thinking of some of Warren's comments earlier here, private sector capital is innately bound by a certain set of obligations. It has to operate under certain rules. We often, you know, in some conversations, we talk about finance like it's a casino in the sky that, uh, you know, spits out great gobs of cash and you can use them for things. And we often say when we know that financial institutions like GFANS, the alliance that Stella mentioned, have made commitments to this, we say, well, there's all this money waiting to move. Why can't we just put it into things? Of course, it's private finance, so we can't put it into things until they have funding models, until they have business models. And often business models are created by policy. And you mentioned demand before. I want to come back to that because we've done a policy review recently of jurisdictions that have been really successful in scaling, basically. Mm -hmm. So they've really been able to take it from an idea to a growth sector to a big part of an economy that's really firing. And one of the features of a lot of the jurisdictions that have had success doing that is that their policy instruments focused on things that could create demand. So instead of saying uh, we're going to allocate uh, state capital to this uh, and we're going to prompt disclosure or whatever it happens to be, they said we're going to ask every government department to procure a certain portion of their um, materials that they procure, depending on what department they are, from green materials. And that proportion is going to go up on over time. We're going to ask our major energy retailers to procure a certain portion of renewable energy. It's going to go up over time. We're going to ask our fuel users, our major fuel users, to procure a certain portion of biofuels or green fuels. It's going to go up over time. Those policies are really, really effective at creating the demand and therefore the business models that unlocks finance because really what you're doing is creating the economic the viable economic models that allow that finance that is in principle willing to support a transition to actually place and land so to speak so a lot of the conversations that we're having on the policy front are increasingly focused on how particularly when we've got countries that are starting to think about this as an industrial growth opportunity how do you create demand because when you can create demand then you can unlock private capital at scale and start to get the types of volumes of activity that we often talk about as being necessary for the task. Now, it's a huge task. So we, um, 
well, you know, that it, I make that sound easier than it actually is. Mm. But I, I also just want to note that Warren made some points that I thought were really important about how challenging resilience financing is. And having just said what I've said about demand, I do just want to highlight that we have also seen um, really significant challenges in play financing resilience, not at the least because a lot of resilience um, interventions, so to speak, or projects are system level projects, but they are also, to a point Stella made earlier, projects that often will be maybe a natural capital project. It will have revenues or, or outcome streams that are not the ones that you're used to seeing. It might not even have a revenue stream and it might be a common asset that's not owned by an individual entity and therefore is hard to structure or hard to place. So the uh, demand creation to help scale activity probably works better on mitigation at the moment than it does on resilience. So we've really got to work to try and find those models that can make resilience investments viable as well. Thank you very much. And, and Warren, I think um, uh, opportunity to, to come to you for your thoughts and comments on that, because you posed earlier on you know, one of the biggest issues we've got, challenges we've got is, is connecting public and, uh, and private fair. And uh, we were just hearing from Zoe about uh, how to use that demand mechanism, but also some of the uh, appropriate, um, I guess, routes for, for different types of finance. Could I get your, your thoughts and comment on that as well? Yeah, the, uh, it, I, this is a, a, a great segue to, to, to talk a little bit about uh, what we call uh, policy-based loans. Uh, we've, we provide policy-based loans frequently to governments that help them to overcome some of the challenges to reform policies, to reform uh, regulations, uh, to reform institutions, to be able to take on uh, better, to adopt better development practices. Our first climate change policy-based loan was in Philippines just a few months ago, uh, and it focuses on a number of issues, uh, particularly on how to how to open space for private sector to play a more substantial role in on the mitigation side. Uh, but the uh, it also provides an opportunity to look at the institutions at the national level whether the capacity is there, and generally it's not uh, in most countries. And so how do you build that capacity to actually implement policies and regulations that, that we've been talking about? Uh, the good news is I think that uh, a number of countries are coming to us and asking for this kind of help. So there's a tremendous interest uh, across the region in and, and recognition and interest in reforming policies and regulations and building the institutions that are required to, to really move into uh, a net uh, focus on net zero. To fo in many of our countries, it's really not about net zero. It's really about uh, energy security. When you're looking at the mitigation side, um, they aren't they aren't big emitters, that, but they they need the energy security. Uh, and on the adaptation side, I think uh, again we've we've talked about the challenge, but I'm somewhat encouraged because I think there's a growing recognition that that much of the adaptation agenda is simply good sustainable development. So it's, it's, it's moving in a direction that is different than what we've had in the past in water resource management, in urban development, um, in agriculture, and, and really focusing on how you undertake large scale national or subnational level investments in different sectors that are more sustainable because they recognize the risks of climate impacts and address those risks to the extent possible. Um, and and that's, that I think is where we're gonna get scale. A lot of this is not going to have a revenue stream. Um, it makes all kinds of sense from, a, from an economics point of view because you're, you, we've seen the costs of, of climate impacts in Pakistan and in China and elsewhere. Uh, these are huge costs to countries and to communities, but probably doing something about the flooding in Pakistan is not going to generate a revenue stream. Um, but there are some parts of it that could. And I think the trick is to figure out those areas of, of adaptation that can generate a revenue stream. Um, and it may just simply be a payment for ecosystem services in some cases, or uh, you know, using nature-based approaches to adaptation and paying those who, who actually protect nature uh, because of the benefits that a city or a water supply receives. So I think we've got to do a lot more work on figuring out how to link the private sector into the adaptation agenda. Uh, but I'm actually kind of optimistic that we're moving in the right direction. 
whether we move quickly enough and at scale again is is the big question um uh, warren could i just stay with you and, and i think i pose this to everybody as a as a little bit a little bit of a side issue but um, energy security has come up a couple of times and of course we we live in a very um, challenging environment at the moment with uh, energy costs around uh, the world spiking, inflation, recession, recessions uh, are on the horizon in many uh, economies as, uh, as well. Um, within that context, has is, is this sort of conversation changed? And do, do you see this as um, something that's knocking back some of the progress that we're making? Or, on, in, in, in contrast, is it actually acting as a spur to, uh, to push forward um, uh, 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 the initiatives that we seem to um, adapt and uh, uh, mitigate uh, climate change? And, uh, and uh, Warren, maybe, maybe if I could just get your quick comment, and then I'll come across to Stella and uh, Helena as well. Well, the quick answer is both. Uh, in, in countries that if you're looking at, at uh, say, a, a Pacific Island developing country that imports diesel, uh, and the reality is now that, that uh, solar is, is cheaper than, than about anything, uh, and we're getting storage systems that work at, at the scale that we're talking about, it makes all kinds of sense for them to, to quickly to accelerate uh, going towards renewables. Uh, but in some other countries, um, uh, that are maybe a little more resource rich, there's, there is some hesitancy uh, on the part of them to, to make that transition as quickly as we've been talking about. Mm. Thank you. And uh, um, Stella, if I could perhaps pose that same, same question to you around the sort of current context. Yeah, I think from a, a security perspective, you know, as you mentioned, um, having that domestic source of um, electricity generation where you don't have to rely on on imports is is going to be very beneficial especially for you know, not only the Pacific but the Indonesian islands and the Philippine islands we are starting to see um, alternatives to um, oil and diesel being developed so sustainable sort of biofuels is something that is uh, very topical and there are a number of projects um you know rather small scale being developed in in some of these countries um but i think you know what i see with some of the the institutional clients that we have is notwithstanding the the the, the challenges in the in the current market they've had such a strategic shift in their business it's it's been transformational so you know companies that you know from india that were in oil refinery and not just india but korea we've started to see a significant investment um in new technologies because i think there's that acknowledgement that that's the future setting up very large scale electric vehicle manufacturing plants in places like indonesia you know through joint venture structures which you know a, a fantastic for the indonesian government and and for the people in terms of creating economic activity building out supply chains in in not only Indonesia, but in places like Vietnam as well, um, which is going to have, um, you know, a significant benefit in sort of the medium term. I think the other point I'd like to make is that um, companies, uh, whether it's large tech companies or, or manufacturers of um, apparel that have factories in um, across Southeast Asia are increasingly focused on greening their supply chain and um, looking for, um, and the point I'd like to make is that they're making investment decisions on where they can have access to um, clean energy and, and, and renewable energy, and also, um, you know, minimizing the impact on the broader environment. So it starts to become um, a strategic uh, advantage for these countries where they can provide that source of um, clean energy and power. And it, it, it is um, very interesting to see, you know, sort of as data centers are built out across India and, and Indonesia and the region, large tech companies really looking for that um, that source of renewable energy and sort of pushing that um, requirement down to their suppliers. So um, my point is, I think, you know, for very large um, energy companies, that their strategy has been formed. There is lots of investment going into the space. So I think the momentum is there that that will continue. But of course, having, um, you know, that affordable access to energy in the short term is a, a, you know, front and center of political decisions and, and um, would need to be addressed. Hmm. Hello, and if I could just um, pick up on that, that comment there, 
um, uh, around the attractiveness for for foreign investors coming in because of energy security or, or the type of energy that's being created. Is that, is that often part of the conversation that you have with policymakers about designing policy to attract in that type of investment um, uh, uh, that will stimulate uh, sustainable economic growth? Absolutely. Well, well, first thing to say is in terms of these discussions, we haven't really spoken about jobs very much, but obviously when politicians are thinking about priorities, jobs are often at the top of their agenda. And in terms of much of the, the renewable energy investment, that is, um, that's job enhancing compared to fossil fuel investment. Um, so our research in Indonesia, South Africa, Colombia, across the world, and, and, and many other researchers as well have found this same, this, this job intensity and, and benefit that you can get. So I think that's a really important aspect. But yes, in terms of the, the, the discussions that we have, absolutely, FDI, FDI is key. Um, um, for instance, on the green hydrogen, countries are getting very interested in, in green hydrogen. So we're starting pilots with Indonesia and a number of other countries. And that's very much um, bringing in foreign direct investment. Um, so it's not the only question. I mean, I think the jobs is a big question and the, the sustainability, the en energy security, these are all issues that are now centre stage. Um, but what I also very much hear, especially from our more fossil fuel dependent partners, like for instance in Central Asia, is how do you manage a green transition when you've got cities that are just literally there for the coal mines. So 45,000 people in a town, all employed by a coal mine. So how do you get that? And what is the alternative um, livelihood and how you can you restructure that economy? Now that could be obviously harnessing the, 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 the foreign direct investment, but you actually have to have the transition in mind um, to, to know the strategy that you need to take. And, and this is why I think it is very fascinating. If we can get a transition in some of these really tough countries, then really it's going to be possible for any country. Now here in the UAE, it's quite fascinating, obviously very high income country, but very oil dependent um, and revenues based on oil. But by 2050, they are planning to be completely 100% renewable energy. Um, so they're making that transition. Now, high income, yes, but how can we then do it in countries that are perhaps middle income? And once we start getting that transition, I think we will have also a cascading effect because it's like that, was it the four minute mile? Once somebody has broken the four minute mile, within the same year, a couple of other people broke it as well. Before that, nobody thought it was possible. Um, so I think we have to show that it's possible and then there will be a replication effect from there. Mm. Yeah, fascinating. And this uh, this idea of the confluence of foreign direct investment and um, uh, and and transition as well, I think, is a very interesting one to explore. Um, we're, we're coming into the last ten minutes or so of the uh, discussion, and I'd like to invite the panel to be turning their thoughts to to the, to the future and um, maybe perhaps highlighting one particular initiative uh, or, or or issue that they think is going to be um, uh, central to uh, facilitating this this transition to um, uh, to net zero uh, and adaptation in in coming years um, and just as you're marshalling your thoughts I've been looking at some of the notes that, that I've got uh, around this the importance of um, uh, uh, capability uh, building in in local institutions the, the, the centrality of of policy development and um, picking up Zoe uh, you were talking on there about um, creating uh, demand uh, and then Helena you were talking about the importance of um, you know, creating jobs as well which all makes this very attractive to uh, to policymakers. Um, uh, Warren to, to your point there about linking uh, public and, uh, and private um, uh, uh, financing and, uh, and making sure that mechanisms are there uh, to facilitate that and the roles of individual players or actors uh, within that continuum of capital uh, thinking about about um, some very development, uh, uh, interesting, exciting developments around bonds, be they green or, or blue, uh, and, um, and and then this uh, this this point that I find very interesting around you know the non-revenue stream projects and, and how do we get private finance uh, uh, involved and excited uh, in those. But those are just some sort of notes that I've got. Um, I'd like them to come around to uh, to the panel and, uh, and get their thoughts about uh, the future. Perhaps it's one thing that we haven't been able to get to uh, so far that, uh, that is important for us to be discussing uh, in this context as well. Um, Warren, I'm going to come to you first and, uh, and, and see what thoughts you have. Okay, I'm, I'm going to mention uh, three things. Um, the first one is that we've got to be thinking much more long-term as development professionals than we normally do. Uh, 
Uh, and of course, that's always a challenge because our counterparts, uh, our clients generally are governments and governments are elected and politicians have a certain lifetime uh, lifespan. And, and so we've, we've got to, we really have a challenge of overcoming short termism if we're going to deal with the kind of challenges that we've been talking about. Uh, two initiatives, I, I mentioned the energy transition mechanism earlier, and I want to come back to that and explain that it's really important when we're talking about uh, the decarbonization or, or net zero that we do look at both at, at three things. And, and the energy transition mechanism is a good model, I think, uh, that's being tested. We're, everything's a pilot now because none of this has been done before. But it involves shutting down coal-fired power plants early, number one. Number two, replacing that with renewable energy. But number three is the just transition element. So absolutely thinking early on at the outset about the need for jobs, for uh, what happens to communities that are affected by uh, transitioning for, from fossil fuels to, to uh, renewables. And, and so we've got to have the whole package. And uh, it's expensive, but if we're going to go to scale, that's what we have to do. The second thing is on mobilizing finance, I, I just want to mention quickly uh, the need to get much more innovative on this on the public sector side. So we're looking at something now called the Innovative Finance Facility for Climate in Asia and Pacific, or IFCAP. And the idea here is, is a whole new approach to mobilizing public sector money for climate finance. Uh, all of the current climate finance initiatives are a dollar in, a dollar out. But we're going to try and mobilize enough resources that we can actually guarantee a part of our climate portfolio take it off our books in essence and, and open up another uh, four times as much money in headroom. So if we can, we're going to pilot this with about a two and a half billion dollar guarantee, hopefully that'll mobilize about nine billion dollars of public sector finance for climate finance. If these two initiatives work, they're very scalable. They can be done by all the multilateral development banks and many of the bilateral organizations that provide similar assistance. And, and I think that's the kind of thing we need to be thinking about in terms of going to scale. Uh, that doesn't solve the problem uh, that we talked about on adaptation. I think we've got a lot more work to go uh, to do in that area. Thank you very much. And um, uh, let me then come across to, uh, to, to Zoe for your thoughts. I just want to, um, I think, extend some of those comments about uh, innovative financing models that can help you get through some of the more challenging items that members of the panel have spoken about. Helena was talking about the challenge of transitioning, pursuing energy security when you have whole uh, regional communities or cities, in fact, that are that are entirely concentrated on um, fossil fuel production, which is a feature of Southeast Asia and also of Australia, obviously. Um, <clears throat> and Warren's been talking a lot about models that basically allow for new uh, collaborations or new sets of relationships that can unlock uh, some of those really difficult issues that can, when they're not addressed, basically provide a bit of an anchor to policy and can sort of stop everything from moving forward in quite a few countries because, of course, those communities often have quite significant political might and they can make, um, you know, if they're if they if they don't see a pathway for themselves, they can make policy making or progressive policy making quite difficult. And I don't mean to frame that uh, those communities negatively at all. I'm from Queensland, which is one of those communities, huge coal mines up there, of course. Um, but one of the things that was really interesting and came through in the last UNFCCC um, or in the IPCC report earlier in the year was the piece in one of the reports. They sort of said, look, if we don't figure out how to do transition in a way that brings all of those communities with us, we don't get to do it. So you know, we can talk about it technically as much as we want, but this has gone from being a technical problem to now being a social um, access, equity and transition for everyone problem rather than just a can we do the lines on the page type of exercise. Um, so instead of highlighting any one particular um, uh, initiative, I would I would just kind of reinforce what Warren has said about the importance of finding new ways to collaborate and to allow whether it's nations, whether it's companies, whether it's financial institutions, to feel a bit more secure and a little bit uh, less fragile about this process and to find support, you know, instead of, I work in private markets and we, we're always, everyone's always saying, oh, just close the coal-fired assets, you know, someone's going to wear it, but, it, you know, that's their fault for having invested in it. 
but that approach doesn't quite work when you have a associated community and a, and a, and a, an ecosystem that sits around that and so you do need to really work to find models that allow you to get through those problems which i think the private sector by itself struggles with and 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 will just find far too difficult and we've spoken a lot about um resilience how challenging that is and how it uh, often heads us in the direction of projects that don't produce revenue that is another space where we're going to need to continue to deepen that instinct for collaboration and to step away from the way that we used to operate in the past whereas you know government's always a little bit at, you know at war with the private sector and the private sector's all looking sideways at the competitors and saying we can't do anything together and instead to sort of move to a approach to these things which says we're all going to be affected by this and none of us has got the key um, so we really need to start thinking about what engagements or interactions between us are needed to um, facilitate the, you know, break the chicken and egg cycle and facilitate the type of change we need to see. Thank you very much indeed. And um, as we rapidly approach time, Stella, um, I'd like to come to you for your, for your thoughts as well. And Helena, please be marshalling your thoughts. Thanks, Andy. I think um, I would echo the comments around the the transition piece. I think the energy transition mechanism is very innovative um, and will go a long way in terms of, um, you know, supporting some of the SOEs in the region who are looking to decarbonize, but obviously, you know, have a number of challenges around that. Um, in Southeast Asia, there is a lot of discussion around what role, if any, um, transition finance may play. So sitting in between the vanilla and the, the green or, or sustainable. And in some ways, sustainability linked loans and bonds are transition finance as they're often tied to decarbonization targets. But I co-chair the APLMA Green and Sustainable Loan Committee. And we recently established a working group on transition finance in terms of how do you define it? You know, what are the parameters? How do you ensure that it, you know, if it is being put in place, it does have a positive environmental impact. And also consider things like resilient economies and societies and achieving that zero at the same time. Um, th this piece around sort of natural capital and, and environmental markets and the um, financial innovation that that will require and, and making of markets, whether it's pricing and, and, and buying and selling the credits. I think this is something that a lot of um, people are looking at to see how that develops. I mean, if you look at the public-private partnership model that's worked very well in social infrastructure and in developed markets and in some emerging markets. Um, there is no reason why, um, you know, something like that, if governments are willing or, or multilaterals are willing to, you know, uh, put some sort of availability payment structure around it, why it couldn't be replicated in, um, you know, natural capital and, and, and projects. And I think this piece around, you um, you know, um, biodiversity risk and natural capital and how do we um, uh, report on it and how do we protect it is going to be an emerging theme sort of over the next year or two. And uh, I think we've spent a lot of time and, and rightfully so talking about climate, but then, you know, how these other risks are incorporated into um, the decarbonisation discussion is going to be become more and more relevant. Thank you very much. And um, Helena, if I could come to you. Super. Through a few areas, green bonds I've mentioned, carbon trading coming out of Article 6 of the COP26, we haven't mentioned, but we're setting up a carbon transaction platform for equal trades between buying and selling countries. Huge potential. I think we need to roll out the green taxonomy in banks and not just the, the, the richest country banks, but globally. Um, and then obviously put money into the development of bankable projects. Um, and this, um, all of us have mentioned it, but how we bring together that public sector money, the private sector money to get to scale. And one interesting example I'll give you. So Thailand waste, making um, energy from, from waste. So we've, we're working on the first um, example demonstration project in Thailand with a leading commercial bank. We hope to scale that to about 200 dump sites. Fantastic for mitigating methane and clearing up the waste problem. So I guess my message and what I try and encourage everybody I come into contact with is we need to think big and it's wonderful what the ADB is doing. But, you know, look at what you're doing and then look at, can we make it 10 times bigger or can we make it 100 times bigger? It makes you think differently. Thanks.
Excellent. Thank you very much. And I think a, a very nice note to uh, to end on there. So um, the purpose of this conversation is to bring people together to uh, talk about the state of the art, to think about um, where we are and where we're going and how um, financing net zero uh, is, is evolving. I think we managed to cover plenty of, um, of ground there, but that final point of thinking big uh, and scaling and accelerating all of that, I think, is, is something for us to, uh, to take away. Um, but also the need to bring people together to find these solutions. So uh, once again, I'd like to thank the ADB uh, for um, uh, 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 supporting this conversation. We wish the ADB um, every success for the year ahead, and perhaps we can come back to the 56 uh, annual uh, meeting to see progress that we've all been making. Uh, with that, I'll bring the conversation to a close and wish uh, each and every one of you and your organisations every success for the future. Thank you. Thank you.